Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one, Blood and Water, written by Wanago Loco. It was 12 Federation standard years ago, when the old machines awakened at the edge of space. They had been relatively dormant since they had been discovered some 400 years ago, only showing activity when someone probed their deeply into their space. By relatively, I mean dead silent until there was an intruder in their space. Then every platform, installation, and drone ship would be activated until the transgressors were eliminated. Then they would immediately return to their slumber. For over 400 years, the galactic community at large simply knew to avoid the space in the stars. They were to be left untouched until someone developed a technology capable of overcoming them. The Frangilli people may have reached that point in the next century, their scientific progress significantly beyond most of us on the council. But 12 years ago, for reasons unknown, they woke entirely, and they were out for blood. Whose blood specifically? We don't know. Our best minds are still working to process the bulk of the data files the machines ran on. We do know that they came for us first, simply because we were the closest to their space. Whether they would have continued to move into your systems had they ended ours, we cannot say with certainty. But that isn't all that important. What is important was we were outmatched. The machines that we have record of outnumbered our equivalent forces 113.7 to 1. The only reason we weren't entirely obliterated in the first weeks was because whoever created the machines never equipped them with FDL capability. The fact that they only traveled at point nine 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 c meant that they came in a much more spaced out fashion. This was especially important, as in outright engagements we were losing an average of 3.76 ships of equivalent class to their one. When the first of our systems were attacked, our leaders immediately sent requests for aid to this Federation Council. We were told that it would be put forth for debate on the floor and to sit tight. Help was only a vote away. But to get to the vote, it had to pass through these separate subcommittees, be reviewed by a panel of scientific and military advisors, filed out in triplicate, and likely buried in soft peat for three months. After three weeks of desperate defense, and already losing half of the colony worlds in the first system, our first outside help arrived. And it wasn't from a Federation species, no. Our first aid came from a species who had only cracked FDL a decade ago and, as such, were still in the exploratory phase of whether they should be allowed to receive an application for the Federation membership. Three weeks into our most desperate struggle in history, a human cargo freighter full of aid supplies and two escorting frigates, who were now apparently human mercenaries, arrived in system. We didn't know it at first, but human space is two weeks from that system with their current FTL capabilities. Upon entering our space, the mercenaries immediately requested to be tied into our battle network. Two frigates, who at best were two decades of technology behind our own, was but a drop in the proverbial ocean. Command patched them in anyway, and the frigates joined our combat formation, interestingly, without any mention of payment. The freighter, meanwhile, began offloading food, medicine, and metals that we could use to patch up our ships, and they offered to take a board and hold full of evacuees to the world's deeper into Federation space. The generosity of a private entity was surprising, but it realistically meant very little in the grand scheme of things. They soon departed with 11,000 women and children to their home world, and as the FTL pulse flashed out of the system, we again resolved ourselves to being alone again in our fight, minus two anemic frigates. Then, to our surprise, only an hour later another group of human ships entered. This time, they appeared to be three mining barges hastily refitted into mobile weapons platforms. Half an hour after that, a swarm of 78 personal craft converted into ragtag fighters patched themselves in. Then shortly after, five more relief freighters jumped into system. This pattern continued for days in ever-increasing numbers. 
Retrofitted civilian craft, freighters, and mercenaries flooded into our system, forming a ragtag battle groups that immediately jumped into combat. We later determined that the combat lifespan of these early volunteers would only be measured in hours, and they still kept coming. Three days after the first fighter had first official military ships arrived, two carriers, six cruisers, and a dozen frigates, and 28 corvettes. Two hours later, a fleet double that arrived. Within six hours of the first fleet's arrival, there were over a thousand military combat craft in system, not including tenders or 18 ships they had already lost in combat in that time. Humanity had sent over two-thirds of their combined space-capable forces from 11 separate governments in their only two colonized systems, and the various admirals promised more were being fabricated to send the literal billions of volunteers flooding their recruitment center. Billions! Counselors, over the course of six years of fighting the machines, humanity sent 1.6 billion men and women across the known galaxy to fight on the front line. In the three years before this council was finally ready to take a substantial action, the humans had already sacrificed 480 million men and women in defense of my people. By the end of the war, only around 400 million were able to return home. Do you realize the context of this? Of course you do, otherwise I wouldn't be here. With 1.2 billion deaths, humanity had given up a full 5% of their population. By the sheer tonnage of ships and aid they had sent us, they had effectively bankrupted their peoples, and all they asked of us was that our findings from the machines be shared with them. Humanity was bleeding itself dry to be cannon fodder, to give us a chance to destroy the machines. If they hadn't come to our aid in those first three years, we would have lost every system in our possession and the machines would have likely engaged in Frangilly space by year two. And all they wanted back was to be included in our research findings. Really, that's what their government wanted. All humanity wanted was our friendship. Now, I stand here before this council to oppose a vote for turning human space into Confederate protectorate. Let's, as the humans say, drop the bullcrap. This is an indentureship contract. You cowardly, dung-heap scavenger bastards saw that humanity had crippled itself and decided to litigate them into what is essentially slavery. For once, I thank whatever divine powers that be that your bureaucratic and tax instrument systems take so long to process that it is also why each of you has a Kormani pulse rifle pressed into the back of your heads, courtesy of the time you gave us to prepare this little coup. So why are we sticking our gills so far out for the humans? Tell me, have any of you heard one of my people say something akin to blood is thicker than water? Come on, I know you must have at some point. It is actually a short and bastardized from a longer phrase that I will get to in a moment. What's remarkable is that both humanity and the Komani developed a nearly identical phrase along these lines early in our respective histories. The full Kamani version of the phrase is, The blood of the honor-bound is thicker than the waters of the spawning pool. I trust the phrase is self-explanatory. Humanity has paid its side of the honor-bound and veritable oceans of their blood, their sweat, their wealth, and their tears. And no being brings harm to the Kamani's bond brother without their blood spilt in the river. Now, counselors, shall we continue with the vote? I am certain I know the end result. I would be ashamed to dye these lovely chambers with so much of your particular shades of red. End of story. Story number two. How many of them can we make die? Written by British Tea Company. From just a rough glance, the scouts said the orcs have us outnumbered five to one. Doing some counting, it looks like most of their ranks are goblins. What about the big ones? I'd given maybe one quarter of their army. Still enough to be a threat. Tch. Then the battle would have been even. There was a haughtiness in the human king's voice as he rode with his son around their camp. A legion of knights in midnight clad geared themselves for the coming battle as swords and lances were sharpened and horses were led to their respective owners. 
I would say that we would even win that, surely. It'd take one of the knights for ten of their rabble any day, the human prince commented as he accompanied his father through the camp. I've already lost count of how many goblins I've crushed underneath my boot. We've already won the battle, son. Any victory is determined before even the first arrow has been fired. Look in front of us. What do you see in that field? No cover. No hiding spots. It is going to be a bloody charge. Exactly. And who exactly is going to win the charge? The side with more horses on their side with more people. Well, uh, that's hard to say, don't you think? When we know little about the enemy's capability. I would say the outcome of the battle isn't quite set. At least, that's the answer I would give to avoid you calling me out for my arrogance. The king chuckled. You're yeah, right, you are. One to five against an orc horde. I'm not betting a man, so I wouldn't chance it. But let me let you in on a little dirty secret. We'll have more horses and more men for this battle. Oh? As any victory is claimed before the battle, let me tell you exactly why. The scout you asked for the numbers glance. Well, he already performed a great service for our army with about twenty good men on the previous night. The prince paused for a moment to contemplate his father's meaning. Before the truth dawned, satisfying him. Poison, wasn't it? Very good, my son. Yes, poison. He told me that they managed to get over half the supplies with their brew. So tell me, how much of your army do you think we laid low without even unsheathing our blades? Half? Oh, a third? Probably a number that has left us more than them. You're a devil, father, the prince said with a smile. His father grinned back with a barbarous glare. If I wasn't, I wouldn't be king of these black gods. Now then, boy, let's see how many orcish heads we can take for our batters. If they seek to bloody our noses, then I will damn well break their necks in return. I would like to see how many of them that we can make die today. End of story. I just quickly want to thank the Tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gaster, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joachim Bakker.